Brilliant. We are back for another episode. Um, if it is your first time joining us, welcome. You are very welcome and you are probably going to love it here if you're a soulful business owner searching for a more heartfelt way of doing business because that is what we are all about. And if you're a regular listener, welcome back. We've got another wisdom packed episode for you as we're joined by yet another fantastic guest. We're so lucky with our guests. Mm. Um, And we are going to be chatting today about what self-leadership has to do with visibility and we're going to be helped by a lovely friend of ours um Gemma Perkins now full disclosure Gemma is another one of our mutual clients yes we are that lucky with our clients um I've been working for Gemma now for probably around three years which is crazy um and Sammy actually has recently done some work with Gemma on her website as well um So we both had a little bit of a a play around with Gemma's mission and what she's been up to. So that's really cool. And we'll touch on that a little bit during this conversation. Um, So we might chat a little bit about this work, um, but predominantly we're going to be talking around the sort of gold dust of the importance of self-leadership when it comes to visibility. So a little intro to Gemma and her business, um, the Self-Leadership Initiative. So the Self-Leadership Initiative has been providing bespoke workshops and training to empower more people to become self-leaders since September 2014. Um, Founded by Gemma, who is a personal development trainer, coach and former teacher, um, the Self-Leadership Initiative provides an unconventional approach to training, which I'm sure we'll talk about during this episode. Um, Gemma, we love this quote from your website about your work, and no, I'm not biased. <laughs> At 25 years old, with no experience of running a business, I excitedly took the plunge, knowing that I loved the vision so much that I would find a way to make it work. Even now, I joke that I am not really a proper business owner. I am an educator, coach, trainer, and my gifts are around helping people grow. Having a business is just how I do it. Since founding the Self Leadership Initiative, I've had the pleasure of working with young people in colleges and universities, head teachers, community groups, pl- political activists, there's a tongue twister, parents and families, corporate professionals, refugees and third sector organisations. My driving mission is to give as many people I can the sort of valuable lessons that helped me to inspire and empower people to be the best versions of themselves. Because if more people brought their best self to the table, the world would be a brighter place so beautiful and I feel like that will really resonate with a lot of our listeners um because that's what most of us are really kind of out here to do in some way shape or form so welcome Gemma to the podcast we're so glad to have you with us thank you very much for having me yeah my pleasure so let's dive straight in because we like that we love good chat How do you see the relationship between our theme of this season, which is visibility um, and, you know, showing up and getting visible and your hero topic of self-leadership? I suppose that my first thought was on, I guess, what is self-leadership a little bit? Because people talk about leadership a lot and they might forget the self element and I was wondering how that relates to visibility, because I think a lot of people who first come across me and my work say, oh, I want leadership skills. And they've got this this view that if I can learn to tell others what to do, um, you know, manage a project, organize people, they will be able to get more stuff done, be an effective leader. And all of that stuff is good but that tends to be the very visible front of the room loudest one talking kind of leadership management stuff and I think that that is the form of leadership we're most exposed to and and what people expect so in terms of self-leadership I like to take a step back and say actually before you are a leader for other people what's going on in your own life can you identify your own purpose, vision, goals, regulate your emotions, manage, not just manage your time 
a lot of people talk to me about, oh, manage my time, get stuff done. But actually, when I talk about managing time, it's about balance. It's about looking after your body, your soul, your relationships, not just your work life kind of stuff. So I think self-leadership is all about your internal world. And for a lot of people, their internal world might not be visible yet. They're, they've been busy working on their external, how do I interact with others and show up? Um, you know, what's my job title? What's the next route of my progression? And it's all about how do I appear in the room? maybe, because that's what they think it's supposed to be. Actually, when you get comfortable with the self-leadership stuff, you develop all this awareness about who you are, your mission and values become visible to you, and then you're equipped with the confidence to televise that to others in a way that works for you so that you attract the right people. And I think that's a more powerful form of leadership then because you've really you know, got your own internal beacon sorted out to, to resonate with people around you. Yeah. That. <laughs> there you know, is so well. much overlap there between <laughs> the self-leadership thing and the, the work that we do and that sort of message that we're trying to spread. So, so glad we got you on for this conversation <laughs> right now. But, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I suppose that's part of why why we've ended up in this conversation, though, because working with the both of you, it's always been about sorting out that internal stuff. If you know who you are, who you're serving and can communicate that, you'll find the right client. So you're doing that in terms of copy, in terms of web website user experience. I'm doing it in terms of leadership and it just works. And there will be people that see that message and it doesn't work for them but that's fine because you've built up your internal confidence that well this is who I am and it, the right people will find me and it doesn't matter what if other people want to do it differently they'll join a different kind of company they'll lead in a different way and that's fine this is the way I want to show up so yeah I think we, we've all got that in common though we do it in different ways yeah absolutely it's really good and I think it definitely you really highlighted how the difference between, I guess, in probably in a lot of institutions or in corporate business, how that sort of traditional model of leadership is really for the managers or for the people in certain positions. And not, I mean, I think some, some businesses obviously are changing and it'd be interesting to know if, if you've seen kind of shifts in that within sort of institutions of really leadership can come from people at, any level and as you say it's it is kind of about that internal um awareness and how it doesn't have to be the big shouty I'm the leader of the pack kind of leadership that we're often think of as you pointed out it, it's a tricky one to say because most of the institutions I work with nowadays are um, student-led organizations which are an entirely different beast or, or charities I think I, I became at peace with not chasing corporate work because I was hitting a lot of resistance to my way of looking at leadership it, it's not resonating with enough of that market but I think I've I've definitely noticed a sense that um, more corporate organizations kind of tangle up leadership and authority so as you say who's got the job title the power okay they're the ones that will invest in for leadership they're the ones who are allowed to demonstrate the leadership qualities and this is the way we expect them to lead and so they leave behind all well again I'm making a generalization but from what I've seen a lot of people get left behind when anybody at any level of an organization, a community, a family, any context can demonstrate leadership because leadership is a verb. It is what we are doing to kind of say, I can imagine a change that would make things better and I want to help get people on board to initiate that change. And anybody can do that. You see children in families coming up with ideas and you might not label it leadership, 
but it's there and for people in friendship groups etc so i think there there definitely will be organizations that that play around with it a lot more and have more um maybe move away from that hierarchical view but it's not as commonly done and i notice from the young people that i work with that they they kind of come to me expecting that hierarchical view of well if i'm not in charge what can i do so i enjoy being able to unpick that early on and working in student organizations they want it to be more shared they just maybe don't realize that's an option so i think being able to show that you have personal authority wherever you show up how you use that to lead is within your control and then you know there's tools and things we can develop to get there yeah amazing and obviously it's a perfect place in order to as you say kind of almost intercept them at that younger age where they're kind of open to that and they haven't yet reached you know their <laughs> the wilderness <laughs> years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um where you know yeah they're learning that early on so how amazing that is well as you always say like building the leaders of the future um and that is what um I love so much about the when we were working together you know kind of hearing you talk about that because it's so inspiring to know that you know you can have leaders coming through that are more focused on well-being and all the kind of other things that are not traditionally tied in with leadership and obviously for us um our audience are very much you know like us sort of empaths highly sensitive and a bit more introverted how much do you resonate with those descriptors um and what role have they played in your own visibility journey i i do resonate with them but i think it took me a, a while to kind of notice if that makes sense so I, I'm a bit of a funny funny old sausage I I'm very empathetic but I'm quite pragmatic and direct as well so I think um like I, I think I'm good at drawing the line between understanding what people are feeling being in tune appreciating new ones but also um challenging people appropriately setting healthy boundaries so it might well be okay I'm, I'm feeling you know I'm noticing you've got these strong feelings but also sometimes that's yours to deal with I'm thinking more about personal relationships here than a work context mm -hmm. um so or or say okay I've noticed you've got these feelings what are you what are your options for dealing with that okay let's move forward so I think there's that balance of meeting people where they're at but if it is not constructive helping them find a way out of it um, where some people who might describe themselves as empaths can get into a sticky situation of taking on other people's burdens and getting a bit bogged down in it all and I I went through that in my very early teenage years and have very much moved past that and got a lot of strategies to deal with that in a healthy way and then in terms of the introvert side of things, I, I am more introverted, but I forget because in, in a room full of my friends, in a room full of introverts, I'm the loudest in the room. <laughs> but you stick me in a networking event with a load of strangers and I, oh, it is, it is not my place. I do not enjoy that. And so like when I'm training, especially if I'm I'm doing a fully fledged team building, throwing bean bags around, building spaghetti towers kind of thing. People would assume I'm some big extroverted weirdo because I like quirky activities. I like to be silly, encourage that discussion. But again, I can play the extrovert because I am serving others. As soon as it gets to the break and people want to do small talk, I'm a bit like, oh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> like, give me, I can do big talk, but I can't do small talk. So those moments remind me, oh, yeah, I am more extra, uh, more introverted, but I, I kind of forget sometimes. 
we keep coming back to don't we the the kintrovert which i think is perfect and we're exactly the same you know how yeah as you say you put you in a room with with kindred folk and all of a sudden you know your real personality can shine but as you Mm -hmm. say networking event yeah it's um (laughs) yeah and that was part of the foundation (laughs) for this whole podcast in the first place was that idea of bringing people together that were of a similar nature so that they could shine and actually feel like they're part of the community um because yeah for the most part shy awkward put me in a room full of networking and the sort of small talk questions of you know got any siblings and that kind of thing you're like oh no god no let's not do that but you know getting into the sort of heart and soul of things and what makes people tick that's really interesting talk but you can really only do that once you've to know people a little bit I think talk to us about the importance of clarity and knowing your ideal client and your mission and what that's meant for you in terms of your journey because I think that's quite important Mm. I suppose that's the more the more recent end the clarity that I have now maybe over this last year I for context the beginning I, I wouldn't say wild I would say exploratory I think you know, in the intro, you you said on the website, I've said, I'm, you know, not quite a proper business owner, which is still probably true. But I think in the early days, I had much more of a, well, let's see what sticks attitude. And I was trying to help everybody because I, and I still stick to my guns that what I do can help anybody. But the shift recently has been working out actually Who do I really want to help? Who do I do my best work with? Um, So I think I've moved from a place of trying to spread myself thinly and send lots of messages to lots of different people to say, hey, I I can do any kind of soft skills development for you and your team. What do you want? And not getting anywhere to to working out who... Who does my work really lend itself well to? And who are the people that would actually book me for that? Because certainly in my business, there's that difference between who I who I want to be training and who who holds the budget. So we've had a lot of interesting discussions about, you know, my ideal client is actually the training managers or the um the people who work within student organizations who are the decision makers um so it's it's kind of getting into their head of what is it they want um what problems can i solve for them so that they then put me in front of their students and i can make a difference but i think it's definitely helped because i've noticed that since i've been more clear of i work with educators and this is why i do what i do this is the kind of outcomes and I've got up, coming up to nine years now of a track record on that to draw from, which is very helpful to be able to say, oh, look, this, this is what I can do for you. Um, and all these other people who are like you have had these benefits. Actually, I've noticed that I've got a lot more signups on my mailing list. I get a few more, not quite cold inquiries, but emails of, oh, by the way, do you do? And it's like, ah, this is working, actually, just having a, a slightly narrower message. And, you know, I'm still I've still got a bit of a way to go in terms of setting up more specific sales pages, more being more intentional on that outreach side of things. But the changes that I have made and having that ideal client in mind have made a noticeable difference, which is quite comforting because I know that for years I've been saying you know joking with you Liv I'm not a marketing person help me with the copy I don't think you were joking well no no sort of saying nothing through it I refuse to niche I don't want to niche I want to help everyone I don't think you were joking when you were saying that no but I I think what you were saying a moment ago about your boundaries um, as a more empathic person, I think probably feeds into a little bit of your narrow narrowing of focus um, and the kind of journey that you've been on with your business has probably more reinforced the things that you need to get from the business as much as 
what you need to give other people mm. in the business. Um, so I think that that's been really important. And we've talked in previous episodes as well about this sort of sto- slow and steady club idea. Um, and I think you're really exemplifying that with the fact that, you know, it's been a journey and a process um, and it's not some sort of overnight success thing um, or a sort of a hustle that you've been on. It's been an iterative checking in constantly, self-awareness, explore, exploratory piece that you've you've had to go through. Um, so I'd imagine if someone said to you, if you could have done one thing to collapse the timeline and get from there to here, you'd say there there isn't anything. But correct me if I'm wrong there. I think it would have been helpful not to go chasing corporate because I did, I made, I was trying to make a business decision about making my organization a bit more profitable because of the personal goals that I had. And I thought, oh, people with money would be in corporate settings rather than young people and charities. Let me try and do some marketing there. But I I don't think it was the right move for me. And I put a lot of time and energy into that and didn't really get anything from it. So in hindsight, that energy could have been directed into being a bit more savvy with the people that I already resonated with. So I think that that's the only change I would have made is that, again, if corporate people come knocking on my door and ask, I have the option to say yes if if we align, but mm. I wouldn't have gone chasing them. I'd have spent more time and energy working on the messaging for the people who I know, know I want to work with, um, and that might have that might have given me a, a year a year advantage compared to where I am, but not you know not much. Yeah, and sometimes you need to go down those rabbit holes don't you to know that that's who you don't want to work with and how that's mm. not working or it's not resonating with you, you know we don't always know what we definitely do want until we do things that we don't want or doesn't feel good and doesn't resonate. And I think it's, it could be easy to slip into that when you're launching your business or building a business to kind of forget the, like what you said, you know, who do I do my best work with Mm. building a business around that is really powerful. But I think that takes a bit of bravery and trust in that that work's going to come in. And especially if you're making decisions based on who you want to help and who you you know who you want to have an impact with rather than who can you make the most money with like I think that almost that takes extra trust doesn't it to follow your heart but then if you're going in that direction you've got that commitment you've got that clarity you've just got more energy because it's the work you want to do um mm. so I think it kind of it pays you back doesn't it in a way because you've just got more momentum than if you're kind of like oh I don't really like doing this but you know it pays the bills and okay there's going to be times when maybe that does need to happen but focusing on as you say just being able to do your best work and for it to be enjoyable is certainly a nicer way to build a business and as we say even if that is sort of slow and steady and that iterative process to to work that out yeah yeah and you were saying a minute ago about how you were joking with me that you hated marketing and blogging and stuff when you first came to me now that you are more aligned and in tune with your people and knowing what you want to go after does that feel different do you feel more more joyful about marketing and like it can actually be fun in your business I still think the word marketing holds too much traditional business uh, icky stuff for me. Um, But I certainly, I think marketing has got that connotation of self-promotion and, hey, everybody, buy from me, which is still quite uncomfortable. But the shift has been, I am here to serve. Here's how I can serve you. Here's what here's how I can use my gifts to make your life better and being able to to name what people might be going through and how what I do helps 
has definitely made it a lot easier to to get across that consistent messaging so it's still not a strength for me in my business you know I'm I much prefer writing the training plans doing the training and even doing the accounts like I like those things <laughs> but I'm I'm much much better than I was and I find that starting from who am I talking to and what do they need is much more comfortable than just I've got a thing to sell. How do I convince people, which is where the icky bit used to be. Yeah. I love the fact that you'd rather do your accounts more than marketing. <laughs> <laughs> that just shows you. I find you do mine too. quite relaxing, like just oh. putting all the invoices in date order and doing the data entry with a bit of music on. I'm, I'm quite yeah. happy with that. But then I've got, I'm a bit of a spreadsheet nerd, so uh, yeah. yeah, everything organized, nice and yeah, just nice and logical. <laughs> exactly. I think that certainly, like tapping into you know knowing and narrowing and niching, certainly when we came to work together was was so much more helpful in terms of you know looking at that user journey on your website and sort of okay, what's the language that these people are going to resonate with and and obviously directing especially as you were looking at working with you know the student side and the more institution side it's like okay we need kind of we need to split this and how does that work and you it means that you can be so much more targeted and really you know and obviously my job was to try and understand from you you know who that client was and how they operate so that we could kind of guide them to the information that they need. And then obviously then the, the layer is of, of really looking at, okay, what do they need to hear? And then that language really speaks to them. And obviously that's where you get that connection and that's really powerful. So it kind of guides the whole process, doesn't it really, when you're kind of refining and and being able to really um, give them the, the, the service at the front end before you even get to work with them, mm. um, that guides them through that process. Yeah, and the kind of what do they say they need, what language are they using took a bit of time to get used to because some of the ways I talk about things and once I've got people in the room, that's the language I'll use, but it's appreciating that actually they're probably coming from a place of why are my students always arguing with each other? They're not saying, could I have a conflict resolution course, please? Or, you know, they, they might not always frame things in the way mm. that I'm talking about, especially when it comes to emotional intelligence, self-leadership. Um, so, yeah, trying to trying to work out what, what language needed to be on the website and whereabouts that needed to be to, to pace people through the journey in a way that was right for them was quite interesting to think about. And again, it stopped the website being, I guess, uh, not quite a product, but it was more of a, it became more of a conversation, which again felt easier for me to, to work with because build a website is very much a, feels like a, or felt like a sales task to me. Whereas help people work through their thinking to get to a place where they know what their next step is. Oh, okay. I do that in training and coaching all the time. This makes more sense to me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's that it's another level of service, really, isn't it? It's like yeah. you're helping guide them to the information they need. You're not trying to force something onto them that they don't want. You know, you're just kind of saying, like, this is, you know, how you can find it and this is how I can help you. Mm. Which is, it makes the whole process much nicer and, you know, less ick being big believers in doing the soul searching and the deep work um, with our clients. And although we lack your psychological credentials, Gemma, um, but how important do you think digging deep and doing that work really is? We've kind of touched on it in a way in terms of how it, how it um, feeds into everything. Um, but why do you think that might be a good investment of your time in terms of doing that sort of deeper work and getting that clarity and that self-awareness? sort of controversially it's not essential there's a lot of grown-ups aren't there that have never done that deep work and seem to be ambling through life so there's a there's an argument for not doing it because oh I don't have the time I'm very busy it costs money etc and and that's fine but my experience is that 
the people I have met who have taken the time to do the deep work have such a stronger foundation to build everything else on that they, you know, know what they're aiming for, but what they're aiming for isn't just what society's told them as well, which I think is important. There's a, the, <laughs> I used to be a teacher and I take great umbrage at the education system, which is why I'm no longer a teacher. But a lot of the people who haven't done the soul searching, their goals are very much about climbing the next bit of the ladder, which in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. But does it come at the expense of other parts of your life that you care about? And how do you even know that if you haven't done the soul searching? And it surprises me how many adults have friendships that are kind of toxic or not quite right. And, and I'm a bit, I wouldn't say cutthroat, but boundaried of if, if something doesn't serve me anymore or somebody mistreats me, I'm like, well, why would I hang out with you? But I notice a lot of people keep people around because that's the way it's always been. Or they haven't, oh, I'd really love to do this hobby, but it's not cool and so I'm not going to do it. And there's all these little things that, they're not they're not necessarily again essential but they make life so much more vibrant and the people who haven't done the deep work seem to be missing all of those things in favor of just the really boring what's my job kind of path so so for me doing that self awareness work working out who you are it gives you the freedom to be able to design your life how you want it and what works for you and to be aware that there's there's a whole different selection of choices out there you can you know live in a cabin in the woods as some sort of eco commune person if that's what suits you you can live a corporate lifestyle you can have a family or not and, and be a cat mom whatever it is all of those options are valid and until you've worked out what matters to you, you you will you'll just fall into something. Whereas when you've made a conscious choice, this is who I am and how I want to show up, you can you can do it with a hundred percent of who you are, rather than always having that little doubt that, oh, what do people think of me? Should I be doing this? So I think that that's the big difference, the confidence that it gives you when you've when you've had that time. Yeah. And and like those things that you're talking about is kind of really what life is about. You know, we're not here just to serve the corporate machine and pay our mortgages and then that's it. You know, if we're not, we haven't got that vibrancy going on, um, then, you know, what is it all for in a way? So it's kind of not saying that um, people that are not doing that aren't enjoying their lives, but yeah, it's, mm. if it is that much richer then surely that, that brings a whole new level of meaning. Um yeah. And how you impact other people as well around you. Because if you have that, um, surely that's going to rub off on others as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that role modelling is really important because I, I, I was just reflecting that I've been doing quite a lot of coaching sessions with young people lately as part of a programme. And a few of them have been talking about what they want to do or maybe an insecurity they have. And a question I've been asked a lot is, is this normal? And it's really interesting because it, there's layers to that. On the one hand, yeah, loads of people are struggling with these kind of decisions and identity things because they haven't had the chance to do this work. So on the one hand, it's common. Is it a bad thing? It depends what you make of it. And, and they'll say kind of what they want to do. And, well, is that okay? It's not what people do. But does that matter? And because they're not seeing people living this maybe rich, unusual, self-assured life, it, it kind of creates a psychological barrier for them. So the more people that are open to saying, I'm choosing to do things my way and that's what my way is and like it or lump it, it will empower other people to realise that's an option. Yeah. Another reason for the <laughs> podcast, exactly that, like... It's having those having those conversations, isn't it? Having these conversations, mm -hmm. um, and people feeling that yeah, they can be, they can, as you say, choose their own path, and whatever that is, that's okay. Um, we're all here for that, definitely. 
So I'm presuming that would be your answer, Gemma, to the question of we're describing self-leadership as a potential secret key to visibility in the title of this episode. Why do you think that is? Which sounds to me like you've just given that us that answer. Would that be right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Once, once you've done all that inner work on yourself and how you want to lead your own life, you know, who you are can then become visible in a confident way because because you're self-assured and you, you know what, what it is you're headed for. Coming back to visibility as the theme for a moment, there's a lot of mindset stuff that comes up and you are pretty perfect for us to talk to about mindset stuff in terms of the kind of gremlins around visibility and I mean for you personally and for you as a professional working with people who have mindset gremlins what do you think comes up most often in terms of being seen and showing up um, and then how do we how do we break that down hmm. yeah there's a lot of different aspects to that I guess in terms of maybe more the the business marketing stuff as I've already mentioned I think my early view of visibility was I'm trying to sell you a thing look how good I am here's me and and that didn't fit with my more more introverted more service-led approach so so changing changing what visibility means into this is how I can serve, basically tying it to my a value that worked for me, I think made, made it make sense. Um, and I guess in my early business, I mean, I started my business at 25. So trying to sort of get into a room and say, hello, this is what I do. Being visible was uncomfortable because... Um, I think it probably was true that there were people in that room judging you're too young, you're not necessarily overtly sexist, but perhaps a woman in leadership was not taken as seriously as a man in leadership. Um, and yet at 25, what experience have you got? How would they know that actually I've got nine years experience prior to starting the business because I've been doing youth training, you know, from the age of about, 16 um so so visibility is tied to vulnerability because you're by putting yourself out there other people have the opportunity to respond and mm. whether you're ready to ignore criticism that's just unhelpful which happens a lot on social media some people want to pull you down for their own entertainment whether you're self-assured enough to know well, this is what I want to do regardless of what you think of it. Whether you've put that time and thought into this is the way that works for me. I think early on there were more doubts because I was making it up as I go along. So being visible, ah, what if somebody catches me out and thinks I'm not a proper business owner? Whereas now I just own it and say, yeah, I'm not, I'm an educator. <laughs> so it's okay for me to be visible in that space because you can challenge me on education policy and how to how to run a training room and I can I can speak till the cows come home about why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that that might answer part of the question on visibility. And then <laughs> for kind of what comes up with other people, I think there's a there's a lot of fear of being seen to do the right thing, mm. which is fascinating. Again, I've had a lot of coaching conversations recently where people are talking about um decisions and stuff and they're saying oh, i want to make the right decision the best what's the way to motivate <laughs> my team or to deal with this conflict and it's like there is no right what does right mean to you and we get into this space where they realize actually there's so many options what are my values and therefore right to me would tick these boxes so that it feels aligned so there's um there's a definite vulnerability in showing up because people worry as to whether something is the right option mm -hmm. what are other people going to think are they going to judge me 
Whereas I think if you've done your self-leadership piece, you can kind of say, here are my values. This is the way I want to do things. There is no right or wrong as such. There's all these different places in the middle. And I'm choosing this option because of the situation, my goals, my values. And if you don't have that stuff in place, you kind of narrow it down to a black and white view, which really limits you. Yeah. There is so much more nuance to things than we allow for, I think, and allow time and exploration for. Yeah. And actually that reminds me that on on most of my trainings, I'll I'll get asked a question or a number of questions where my answer is it depends, because people seem to want a textbook (laughs) kind of how should I deal with this conflict or What's the best way to run my project? How do I? What? It depends. And I'll give them the list of all the things, you know, I say to consider, but not as a checklist, more as a set of questions of what are you trying to achieve? What are the motives of the people around you? What are the confines? How do? You, how are you feeling right now? And they're like, oh, this is a lot more complicated. It's like, yeah, it is. So, you know, it's great that you've asked the question, but if you're expecting a, a quick answer, then you've kind of misunderstood what leadership is because leadership is all about dealing with that nuance in an emotionally intelligent and, and wise way. And that takes the time and practice. You can't just kind of checklist a set of instructions of how to work with people. People are more complicated than that. Exactly. And I think that's well, maybe talking from a bit of experience, but I think that's what what a lot of managers mistake mm. about leadership because they're not listening or they're not attuned to the people around them, the emotions, the you know all that all that stuff. So it's that's that's like a kind of a real missing <laughs> missing um, key to a lot of people who think they're leaders and really are doing quite the opposite Mm. all the working from home stuff struck me as an interesting example of that because even when they do listen it's it's counterintuitive it's like okay we'll do a survey and work out how many (laughs) days people want to come in okay the most popular option is this so we'll just enforce that on everybody no that's Why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. Do it on an individual case by case basis. But there's this, yeah, if we do listen, we listen to come up with one solution and apply it across the board, which is also a bit, a bit messy at times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Because obviously you got, they're coming in two days a week. Why do I have to come in three days a week? (laughs) Kind of thing. So yeah, that's a whole, that must be an interesting time in the work you do throughout kind of the whole COVID piece and all the changes that are, well, I'm sure, especially within, you know, the education system must have been for universities and students, obviously a, a real tricky time to um, to navigate everything. Sort of, but it's also opened a lot of opportunities up. I'd done a bit of remote training um before lockdown for for some of the charities that I worked with but it was a real opportunity to show that you can do interactive stuff in a remote way um so I you know use a lot of breakout rooms we can annotations jam boards even some physical stuff where people are in their own space so you can still do that self-reflective piece and because I could pivot quite quickly into taking what I do in the physical space and doing it online and having those deep discussions, actually I've been able to develop quite a few interesting new programs and workshops and reach audiences that I wouldn't have reached before. Some of the recent work that I've done has brought together people from all across Europe, Africa, and a little bit of Asia um for for like a 12 week program talking about leadership in an intercultural context and it's been really really wonderful stuff and i probably wouldn't have had that opportunity were it not for for lockdown because there wouldn't have been as much demand for it but flip side there are challenges as well to some 
young people for whatever reason will you know sign up to something probably not turn up but if they do they've got their camera off and they're expecting a webinar because that's what maybe universities are doing that's what they're seeing and they think oh if I just log in and do some cooking while I half listen to this thing then that'll tick the box yeah but as we've said you know this is about doing deep work you can't really I mean, you can try and multitask on it, but you're not going to get the full amount out of it. So there'll be people who kind of say, oh, I wanted more detail or I didn't quite get as much out of it. And I'm like, oh, but if you'd have participated, you might have got somewhere. <laughs> not <laughs> so something you can do things. half assed Yeah, basically, basically. Got to give it your focus. Um, well-being is a big deal for you and obviously you have your own sort of well-being programs we know it's like really center to everything you always come kind of come back to that as being kind of in the center with all the different kind of pillars yeah. that you incorporate in your work um have you got any tips for us in terms of how we can look after ourselves as soulful business owners and empaths <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah ways for us to obviously it's quite hard when you're running your business with that, to have those um boundaries and working from home and all those things you know it's kind of you don't kind of leave the office as such so um yeah any tips on how we can kind of take care of ourselves would be welcome I think the the two major headlines would be find what works for you because there's a lot of well-being stuff out there and there's a, a lot of annoying gurus who will say you must do these things and it's like give over like no they might work for some people and that's fine unless you find something that's aligned to what you want and need you're never going to stick with it um and the second point is to ring fence it somehow however big or small you dedicate to it it, it's valuable it's an investment I think a lot of people certainly we're in the entrepreneurial space but from all walks of life have that unfortunate myth of oh well I'm too busy so I'll drop that first that is a good place to to steal some extra time back from but you notice the effects if you do that whereas if you've really built it into your day in a place where it's less likely to get taken over then I think you you build your resilience and your your robustness to be able to deal with stuff um I I talk to people sometimes about there's kind of three approaches to stress and well-being. One is denial. I don't need to deal with this. I'm just going to ignore it and carry on. (laughs) There's there's a reactive approach of, oh, no, I'm really stressed. Now I'm going to rest. And then there's I'm going to rest a bit each day so that I don't get stressed in the first place. This is brilliant. And a lot of people find it difficult to shift from that reactive place to the building it in each day place um I certainly know that for me once I've got going into my work day I might find it hard to to bring that rest in so I kind of do my journaling my gratitude my exercise before I've got started because that's the time of day that I know I'm most in charge of and I'm not I'm not going to lose it and trade it off so I think knowing yourself and how your day works when when it's easiest to set boundaries allows you to curate a routine for you and again everybody's different I'm I'm not a big exercisey person but I have found something that works for me that allows me to invest a bit in my body um whereas like the the more thinky stuff the journaling the vision boarding that comes more easily to me because I've had much more practice so I can kind of do that in the afternoon if I want because I'm more primed for it so explore what's out there and work out what would most serve you to either kind of replenish you or protect from having challenges in the first place. Yeah, it makes you a lot more ready to cope with things or you just, as you mm. say, you don't, you don't get so much into that reactive state. And I guess it's partly making that as a non-negotiable. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one of the... My my history has been a bit patchy, but when I have 
got into like no this really is a non-negotiable because I know the outcome and the outcome's not so good so mm-hmm. it kind of you you feel like you're saving time but it bites you in the bum because actually you're probably not as productive you're more tired you know you are more reactive so mm-hmm. it's kind of really putting the value on that isn't it and, and making mm-hmm. it a non-negotiable to really and as you say putting it in the part of the day when you know it's going to be least likely to be sort of run into or overtaken Mm. and mindset is huge around that so notice how you talk to yourself about that time because if you say things like you know oh I I need this time I have to have this time because if I don't I'll be stressed overwhelmed you're actually focusing on the more negative aspects of what's going on which might help some people that gives you that kick up the bum motivation and urgency but if if the goal is to have this preventative approach and to be really investing in a robust self-care routine, then reminding yourself the positives you get, such as when I get a good night's sleep, I feel refreshed, I have more energy, I am, you know, calmer when I communicate with my friends. Tell yourself what the good things are, because then when you're in that moment of going, oh, have I really got the time for this? actually here are the good reasons to do it and and yeah, that's positive that so trains easy. you mm. yeah it's a really good point it's so easy to think of like you know, say if you're thinking of the preventative to think oh well that will stop me from getting stressed or this or that but yeah as you say reframing it that's a really good point I will and we try to do that with the copy as well <laughs> don't we we try we try and focus on the transformation stuff not the oh uh, well if I do this then I won't feel this it's the Role yeah, when I get yeah. yeah which is it's really amused me because obviously I'm I'm hot on reframing when it comes to well-being and leadership and coaching and when you were like oh we're gonna reframe around copy I was like oh no I, f- I, forgot, <laughs> I forgot to apply my own skill set in this context <laughs> which is why we all need to to keep you know working on our self-development there are always blind spots and the benefit <laughs> of to getting support from other people because as you know as you say, you're expert in that, but then you're it's applying it in different ways. And mm. as you say, everyone has their own blind spot. So it's nice to have somebody else to be like, hang on, did you think of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which may lead nicely into our next question, which is what have you learned through your own business journey about using your energy wisely in your business? Yeah. I I, I kind of, when, when I saw this one in advance, thought, Oh, this is interesting because I know we've had conversations about, you know what, this is not my area of expertise. I don't need to put my energy into this. Um, Having a growth mindset means I know I could, you know, if I want to learn how to do this thing or spend the time getting good at it, I could. But actually, sometimes it's more efficient to play to your strengths or do the things that only you can do and and actually outsource the other stuff and go, you know what, you're really good at that. You like doing that bit. You crack on with that bit so I can do the bits I like. So that's actually, and I I think it's been liberating, but I, I guess a nuance or caveat to that is that early in my business, I didn't have as much resource to be able to to choose where to outsource you if you're bootstrapping you kind of have to do everything yourself because that's what you've got the budget for and I it took me a long time to get over that mindset where even though I could have brought people on earlier because my business has been around a while now I am making some money I still had that mindset of oh it's my business I I need to do everything. It needs to be me. So it, it took a while to realize, actually, the some things are not important, actually. Everybody tells you, you should be doing social media or writing a business plan in a formal way. And I'm like, well, why do you need that? As long as you know where you're going, do you have to have like a 20-page document with all these objectives? Actually, it's better use of energy to just crack on with the website or whatever it is. So I think, yeah, I, having that, being at peace with noticing which bits of the business I want to spend my time in and that I'm I'm good at spending my time on and leaning into that and then working out where to bring other people on board has been really helpful. Yeah, that's a that's a brilliant, brilliant tip. Well, 
it's been an amazing conversation um thank you Gemma oh thank you um obviously as our listeners know we always like to finish on um our final question which is what one thing do you want listeners to take away from this episode so if we started the phrase dear soulful business owner I wish you knew this how would you answer it I wish you knew that spending time on yourself is the best investment you could make. And I suppose we don't need to go into too much more detail because we've banged on about it, but whether that's your well-being, your vision, your confidence, whatever it is, if you've done that inner work first, you've got such a strong foundation for everything else that comes next. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing, Gemma. It's been an absolute treat. Oh, thank you for having me.